As Father God in heaven, we come to you this morning as men who need, we need you so badly. We love you, Jesus, and we thank you, Father, that you sent your one and only son, Jesus, to die on the cross for our sins. And Jesus, you came as the Lamb of God, gave your blood and your body to pay the price for our sin. You went to the cross. What a blessing. You went to the cross and you took the wrath upon yourself to pay the price for our sin. And then you rose from the dead on the third day. You walked out of that grave, defeating the power of sin and death in our lives. And you made us born again children of the living God. Our name's written in the book of life for eternity. We're so thankful. We are so wonderfully thankful. I am so thankful. I think about this as I just let my mind be open to you, Lord, to think about what it is to be able to pray this prayer in front of these men and the men who are watching and are going to see this video, that we can all be thankful. Oh, Lord, thank you, Jesus. Amen. What I was thinking was, if, as we go through and... Uh, and as we've been thinking about all the things we were, we were just talking about a minute last week when we were talking and we were going through everything, um, the blessings of last week was that we talked about the snake that Moses had put up in the desert. And it was a, um, that God had brought these snakes uh, to punish and to uh, discipline the Israelites. And the Israelites were not exactly responding correctly. We went through that whole thing. We talked about it. And we read the passages, and uh, what we learned was that if you would just look at this bronze snake that Moses had put together, that the, the poisonous snakes, when they bite, you'd be saved, okay? You just have to look by faith. And then we learned that Jesus said, that is an example that was put there as a point and an example of me, so that when I went to the cross, and I'll go to the cross, you look at me, and you'll be saved. And, and that action is by faith and faith alone. There's no works. There's nothing you can do to, to qualify yourself. It's plain and simple, that action of faith. And the point is that faith is something that we believe in a, an individual, in a person, and that person is Jesus Christ and what he did. Not in ourself, not in what we did, and we did not earn our way in. So today, now that is how we hook, and that's how we become the branch on the vine, okay? We have salvation. Now, today, we're going to talk about what this is really all about, what he's talking about in the 15th chapter. I'm going to read this, and then we'll talk about it. And that is, look at it from the perspective of now you're a Christian, and how do you respond to the world and all the things and all the temptations you have and your, your flesh and your natural desire for sin and all the things that are going on in your life? How do you deal with those things? And that's what Jesus is going to talk about. He's giving them instructions. He's about ready to go to the cross, if you remember. This is right after the last, the last dinner. This is right after the last supper. And he, he's giving them this information. And it's, he, who's he giving it to? Judas is gone. Who's he giving it to? He's giving it to these people, these disciples, who truly believe in him. And he has told them, you are the branches and you're on the vine. And now he's talking to us. So let's read that from this perspective, okay? So here we go. John uh, 15, I'm going to read it and then... We're going to go into some concepts. It says, I am the true vine. My father is a gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Now notice, every branch where? Every branch in me. So they're in him. They're there. We talked last week about how we get to be a branch, okay? While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. And remember, the word is remain, okay? Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers, which which such, uh, such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, allowing yourselves to be my disciples. So that as we connect with Christ, and we uh, go through the things that we're going to talk about, that he wants us to do to love one another, that if we then pray to bring glory and honor to the Father through whatever it is that's according to his will, he will, he will do it. Okay, because we're going to be one with him. We're going to be wanting what he wants. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. 
if you keep my commands, this is a key statement, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. So one of the ways that we are, we have the joy of the Lord and the peace that transcends understanding is by doing what? Abiding in Christ, obeying him to love one another. He says, I've told you this so that my joy may be complete in you and your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. In other words, it's not about me. He said, it's about you. I love you. So I'm giving everything for you. And you should turn around and give to others. I had a conversation with a guy not too long ago in another group about this idea. He's having a trouble with his, uh, his daughter and he, and there's a, a, a relationship rip. It's been going on for a while. And he, he, you know, he says, she's uh, unreasonable. She's, uh, she's done some things and whatever. And I said, but you're, you're the father and you're a Christian. And so the word mercy, do you know what the word mercy? Mercy means that you do not, you do not extract from her what you deserve. In other words, you give her mercy just like God gave you mercy. And you give her mercy so that she can see God working through you. It doesn't make her right. It just makes her loved. It makes her feel the love and know the love. Uh, we were talking to a friend of ours, as you know, part of the group here. And his uh, stepdaughter um, tried to commit suicide. And we have... Suicides now are just off the charts in the United States, and, and because the people are losing, they're losing total um, hope for the future because they, they don't they don't feel that there's anything there for them. They don't have the peace of God. They don't know what it means to have people love them more than they deserve. Because guess what? Why does a person want to commit suicide? Because they really believe they don't deserve anything. They can't go to anybody. Who can they go to to get love and to get acceptance when they feel like that? And it's only to those people the family members, the fathers, and that's where we come in, and the, and the brothers and the husbands, we need to be there to give mercy. Because God says, Jesus said, you don't give mercy, there's not going to be mercy for you. And if anybody needs mercy in this world, it's me. And that's why I, I'm, I'm really big on this. And uh, so I'm praying for this guy. I talked to him all about it. I said, how's the mercy going? You know, when are we working on mercy? And it's not what he wants to work on. He really wants her to say he's right and she's wrong. That's what he wants. And, and that young lady, either he's, he'll, he, can, he can be gone before that happens or she'll be gone before that happens. If you leave it to this world. And that's what it's all. And this, this is not, we're not to do things tit for tat. If Jesus did that, if God did that, none of us would ever exist. Okay. So let's continue here. Verse 14. You're my friends. If you do what I command, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I have learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the father will give you. This is my command, love each other. So again, he's saying, pray and ask and trust me and I will give you to bring glory and honor to the father. Verse 18, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. In other words, all the things that you and I are going to talk about today about following Christ doesn't mean that the world is going to embrace you. In fact, the, the world's going to oppose you because you're not living by the same rules that they're living by. OK, you have different rules and different ideas and you get all excited because the moral laws of the country are being broken down and everything. They don't have the moral laws and they don't care about the moral laws because they don't care about God and they don't want to be told about that. They don't want to be told what's right and wrong. They want to do whatever they want. And all you become is a problem. And so what you need to do is to love these people and have mercy and treat them in a way that they don't deserve. Did you hear that? Treat them in a way they don't deserve. Well, if they treat me right, I'll treat them right. That's not how it works. That's not how it works. We treat them better than they deserve, not as they deserve. Because some of us are really good at, you know, we're going to get what we deserve. And God says, you want what you deserve? You know, you better rethink that. Because your whole life is based on the mercy and grace that God has poured into your life. He goes on here. He says, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I've told you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, <clears throat> they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching... They will obey yours also. 
they will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of this sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father as well. If I had not done among them the works no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. And as it is, they have seen, and yet they have hated both me and my father. But this is to fulfill what is written in the law. They hated me without reason. In other words, Jesus had to come and love. This is the prophets. Right? He came and he loved everybody. He healed everybody. He cast out the sp evil spirits. And he was there as God himself, loving everyone. <clears throat> there were times when the people were coming and he healed them all, every one of them. He fed the 5,000. He fed... He did all these wonderful things, and they still, what? They wanted to kill him. They, wanted, they rejected him. And it's amazing if you think about what this is. He says, but this is to fill what is written in the law. They hated me without reason. When the advocate comes, that's the Holy Spirit, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. The Holy Spirit comes and the ministry and what Jesus is all about Jesus Christ. It's the Spirit of Christ that comes. And that's the Holy Spirit. That's what he does. And you also must testify. Now, this is a biggie because we're going to talk about this today. For you have been with me from the beginning. Now, let's take up the notes. Uh, you guys that are on the Zoom, I sent them out with the email and they're on your table right here. And I, I titled today, Abiding in Christ is to Obey. Abiding in Christ is to Obey. That's what Jesus said. We just read it. But think about what that means. So now... Now, I'm gonna, now, let's look at this from last week. Last week, we reviewed what it is to become connected to the vine. It is to look to Christ and to believe in him for your salvation, to confess your sin and to come to him and believe there's nothing, I repeat, nothing you can do to save yourself other than to what? Look to Christ, what he did on the cross, okay? That's where we start. That's the premise. Now, you're connected to the vine, all right? Now, when you're connected to the vine, Jesus says, you're now my friend. You now need to obey me. Why? Because now you're connected to the vine. And if you do that, the Father will produce and fruit will come out of you and you'll produce fruit. Now, what does he say? If you don't, what's going to happen to you? You're going to be removed and you're not going to be able to produce fruit. You, you get removed from the fruit bearing. And how do you get back? You'd have to come back and do what? Like Paul says in the, I think, in the 11th chapter, of, uh, of Romans, he said, we, we go back and we, we, we come back and we get re-grafted re, uh, back in. All these things are important for us, right? And we need to know that we have this, we can come to the throne room of mercy and grace so that we can confess our sin and he's there. Jesus is our advocate, as it says in the eighth chapter of Romans, and he's there all the time for us, okay? But listen carefully now, here we go. The first thing it says, to be Christ-like, and this is big time. If you look at the last sentence that we read in the 15, last verse in uh, John 15, it says, be Christ, is to identify with him. We need to identify with Christ. Do you identify with Christ or do you sort of hide your Christianity because it's inconvenient? Do you identify? Because if you don't identify with Christ, there's not going to be any fruit. All right. So it says here, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Galatians 6, 22 through 23a. Now, what does this mean? It means that if you and I will not identify with Christ, the power of Christ will not be in us. And in fact, there's a very chilling statement that Jesus says. He says, if you don't identify with me here, down here, I'm not going to identify with you up there before the Father. That is a real problem. And we need to identify with Christ. In other words, if people, uh, Jim, Jim Nicole, our brother who was here sitting at that table right there forever, passed away yesterday, okay? And you all know he had really bad heart situation for like 10 or 11 years from when I went and prayed with him in the hospital. He came out with 25% of his heart functioning and he's lived. We played golf and all these things and he passed away. And he, he just got to the point where his heart rate kept dropping and dropping. He was sleeping. He, he couldn't do anything to bring it up or would have killed him. So he eventually just, you know, passed into the Lord. And he loved the Lord. He knew the Lord. He loved the Lord. We talked about it. He sat right in the, the middle table back there. And, you know, I think about this for a minute. And I think about what it means that the peace that he had, I think about what a good guy he was. And he did exhibit a lot of that. The fruits of the Spirit. He was very generous and all those kinds of things. 
And, and you think about this, we're not going to be here forever, but are you identifying Christ? Did, if the people who went, we, I knew him at the club where we play and everything. I said, do you, do you think the guys there identified him as knowing Christ? They did. They did. He had problems. He did silly things and all kinds of stuff, but he identified with Christ. And a lot of times when you identify with Christ, they look at you and say, well, how could you say you're a Christian? You know, they say that to me, you know, whatever. Every once in a while, my wife will say that, hey, you know, you think you're such a man of God. What are you doing this for? And the answer is, you know, I do identify with Christ and it puts pressure back on me to say, are you going to abide or are you not going to abide? Or are you just going to run off? And do, because when I'm not abiding and I'm not, you know, following Christ and I'm not living, you know, giving mercy and grace, what happens? There's no fruit. And when there's no fruit, there's no blessings. And I'm not blessing others and I'm not getting the blessings. I don't have the peace, right? That wonderful comfort and that peace. When you guys bless others, I can tell you, I have, I remember when we started years ago and we did all kinds of things. We started doing this or that and the other thing, just letting God work through us. And at first I would never do that. I would never do this. And I would, I'd never take my time to do that and the money to do this. And then the Lord sort of put us in this. We did this. We did this. We went here. We went there. I, I still think Dennis at that time, we went and saw Sam, the guy that played the piano. And, you know, it was like nothing we would normally do, but we went there anyway, you know, because we knew the Lord wanted us to do it. And when Sam and I walked out of there, I mean, not Sam and I, but Dennis and I walked out of there. The joy in our hearts, I mean, the smiles on our faces. And Sam didn't get better just when we went there, but we got better. Our hearts got better. We became motivated because the power of the Holy Spirit <clears throat> pushed us further on to do more and to be more and to be more of what we were. And so we did more and more things, right? I mean, we got involved with more and more things. And I just think about it. Um, you think about a lot of people when I, I remember in ministry, you look at something that, you know, this is really going to take up a lot of time. I don't have the money. I don't have the thing. And my wife, and I don't know if I'm going to do that. And, you know, I'll pass on that, you know. And then there's time, you know, then you go back, but the Lord brings it back. And then you go ahead and you say, okay, I'll come over to your house. You want me to talk to your grand, your, I had a lady say, I want you to talk to my teenagers. <laughs> what am I going to tell them? You know, quit messing around with your girlfriend and, don't drink so much and don't get arrested and whatever. What am I going to tell them? You know, and they don't want to hear about Jesus. They don't want to, you know, some old guy. I mean, back then I, I probably was 45, 48. I thought I was an old guy, you know, coming in there to talk to them. And she says, that's okay. I'll bring them to your house. I go, <laughs> so my wife, so here she brings them to my house, right? The, you know, two of them, a daughter and a son. And I, and she sits them right down in my living room and I'm supposed to fix them. You know what I mean? Thought, oh my gosh, Lord, what is going on here? And so I just started talking to him. And we talked about this, that, and the other thing. And it wasn't too heated. You know, I didn't do anything weird. I think she was expecting me to whack him or something. I don't know what to do. And I talked to him. And, and we, I talked about the Lord. And I talked about this and how, you know, your mom loves you and, you know, this. And they left. And my wife and, look, I, my wife and I looked at each other and went, wow, you know, what's this all about? Now, why did that happen? Okay, because I had been identifying what? I had been identifying with Christ. And there was a woman who had a great need. And she had a husband who couldn't step up and say what needed to be said. Now, those children to this day, when I see them 25 years later, 20 years later now, they have a whole different attitude when they meet me. It's like they think I'm their friend. Do you know why? Because all I did was be available and let them know that God really exists and there really is Christ and there really are, there is a difference between right and wrong. That's, that's all we did. And it wasn't like, and, and I think about this for a minute and listen, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And that one fit into what? Kindness, right? That one was kindness. And I, you guys can go through and we can talk about all the things that are going on. I, I go to number two. It says, we cannot bear fruit, fruit of the spirit in our lives unless we are cleansed each day by the faith-based sprinkling of the blood of Christ. This is really important. Throughout the Bible, what is the thing? One of the things that God always says all the time. He says this, remember. Let me say it again because you might not have heard that. Remember. If there's anything you're going to remember about this message, 
Remember. You know why? Because we have a tendency to forget. And because the world is banging on us all the time. Uh, first Peter, uh, Peter tells us that the evil one is roaring, is uh, roaming around like a lion to devour all those he can. And who does he devour? Those who do not remember the word of God. Those who do not remember the promises. Those who do not remember that the power of God is within them. Those who do not remember to pray or read their Bible. That's, that's who he devours, okay? And the idea is that we need to listen very clear, carefully to what God's word says. And we need to remember what it says. So let me read this. It says, it said, we need to, we cannot bear the fruit, fruit of the spirit in our lives unless we are cleansed each day by the faith-based sprinkling of the blood of Christ. So here we go. Number two, it says this. This is, this is in Hebrews 10, 22 through 25. I want you to hear this. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed in the pure water. I say the pure water, what? God's word and his spirit. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Every day we need to do this. Every day. Let us, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as we see the day approaching. Now, I see the guys in here, and I know there's guys on the, on the Zoom meeting. Guys, you need to go out and encourage other people to come and to be part of the group. We have guys that are not here. I know who they are. We've got a list of the guys who've been here before. And I talk to the guys, and I'll talk to so-and-so. And, -so and, and there's no good reason, really, no good reason. They just got off into something else. They got in a habit of working out at this time of the day, or they got in a habit of doing some other thing, you know, whatever. And the answer is, listen, we need each other. We need to remember why we're here. We need to remember why it's so critical, why it's so critical for us to meet together and encourage each other. So number three I have here, to be connected with Christ each day is to humbly pray in a spirit of repentance, confession of our sins with a humble and contrite heart. Listen to that. What God's looking for is not service as much as he wants a humble and contrite heart. And I look at this as uh, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, who's faithful? He is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. He's the one who's faithful and we're to come to him each day. Why just, well, I don't think, I can't think of any sins to, you know. Listen, that's not it. Every day you come and during the day you pray. Do it in the morning, do it at night. And then during the day when you, you know you've sinned and you've thought something you shouldn't, confess it to God. And he will, he will cleanse you. And you'll be right with him. And you'll be connected with Christ. And, and you'll be available. Because when you're in sin, you're not available to let the fruit of the Spirit come through you. We'll go on further. It says here, number four, to be clean before the Lord, we need to confess and repent of our sins. And identify, now listen, and, and identify by daily study and memorization of the word of God. And this is in Psalm 119.9. It says, how can a young man uh, stay on the path of purity by living and knowing and following the word of God? We do it by knowing, memorizing, and following the word of God. And then, and then I love this one. You guys know that we worked on this for years, but uh, this is Psalm 1. And it says, blessed is the man who does not walk in the, in the step, or I'm going to do it the way I memorized it, walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, in God's word, and he meditates on it day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like the chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous, for the Lord, now listen, the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Now you're going to say, okay, well, I'm, I'm saved, so I'm, I, I'm on the way to heaven. But there's a dynamic that happens, and we're going to talk about it throughout the, the New Testament. It says, you are saved. You belong to God. But now, what are you going to do? Where do we go from here? And the answer is for you to be and stay connected and to be powerful, to let the Spirit flow through you, you need to stay and abide in Christ. We're going to talk about what that means, and we're going to continue. So he says in number five, he says, we are to abide in Christ each day. Now listen, 
through prayer and Bible study. Then true spiritual fruit, pleasing to the Father, will be created by the Holy Spirit. Psalm 119, 20, uh, 23 and 24 says this, which is really, really important. And it really hits the point is what we're talking about. It says, and you as I as a Christian, someone who's following the Lord, this is something we should pray every day. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Nancy and I together pray that. We pray that every morning. We pray it every morning for 40 or so years. Every morning we pray this. We have a list of Psalms and that's one of them. And why do we pray that? Why do we pray that? We pray that because we know that we've got anxiety, we've got anxiety, we've got this, we think about that. And we want God to search us to see where we are in those areas where we're not making him the Lord, where we are taking upon ourselves the responsibility for these problems, or where we, we're sort of, we just can't handle the anxiety because he's anxious thoughts. Because all of a sudden, when you let anxiety rule you, listen carefully, then God is not ruling you. You are forgetting that God exists. You're not living in the fear of the Lord. You're living in the fear of what? The fear of the problem whatever your issue is. And when you take the problem and you let God be bigger than the problem, you let God be in the midst of the problem, you allow God to be who he is, he gives you the peace that transcends all understanding that you talk about in Philippians 4, 4 through 7. And without us remembering and going back, so what I'm saying is this is a daily process of abiding in Christ. Look at number, uh, at number six. It says, However, if we become focused on all the world has to offer and our own personal desires rule our life, our thoughts and decisions, we will not be able to, listen carefully, we won't be able to die to self and live for Christ. Because if we're so focused on the world and all the things we want and all the things that our desires want, our fleshly desires, we will not be able to die to self and live for Christ. It, it's just too painful. We can't do it. Oh, I can't give up this and I can't give up that. Now watch what it says. This is in 1 John 2, 15 through 17. You need to memorize this. You need to remember it every day. When you walk down every day, it says, do not love the world or anything in the world. Whoops. What do you mean? Because this world is not your home. Let me say it again. Do not love the world or anything in the world. This world is not your home. It goes on further. If anyone loves the world... Love for the Father is not in them. Let's say that again. If anyone loves the world and all the things of the world, the love of the Father is not in them. Well, wait a minute. You mean when I, when I let loose of that and I mess that up, what does that do? That means I'm not abiding in Christ. That means I'm a branch that's not abiding in Christ. That means I can't produce spiritual fruit. That means I'm not identifying with Christ. Now, I'm a Christian, but when I do this kind of a thing, it disjoints me and separates me, okay? Now watch what it says here. He says this, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, now listen, everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. Don't you know, when something good happens and you do something good and you just have that great feeling of pride. Man, I did it. Well, it happened, you know. Hits the home run, the bottom of the night, bases loaded, wins the World Series. They put the mic in his thing. I'm so proud that I worked so hard all my life and I had the opportunity and I'm so proud of, you know. Instead of the first thing they should say when they put that mic Right there, he said, I am so thankful. He said, what do you, I'm thankful that God gave me the opportunity. I'm thankful that the coach and the team trusted me enough to put me in. I'm thankful this is such a blessing. Or all the stuff you normally hear, right? How many times do you hear the one or the other? <clears throat> Maybe eventually down the road after their father calls me, hey, son, you got to remember to thank God. Or the wife calls up and say, hey, you sound like a real egotistical fool. Or whatever it is that eventually gets them to do the press conference and say something worthwhile. What do you think? What's the first thing you think? What's the first thing you think when something happens? Praise God. Thank you. 
Thank you, Jesus. And a lot of times I'll say something like, praise the Lord, I'll be around somebody or something happens, and they'll go, they'll look at me like that. And I said, hey, hey, I got it. I'm a Christian, and you got to understand, this is, this is what I do. And this is, I've not ever had a problem with this. I'll say something, and they'll look at me like, you know, there's that religious guy going off or whatever. And I'll go, ah, I, I'm sorry, I'm a Christian. And for me, everything's about Jesus Christ. I'm sorry. In other words, I, I just say that's who I am. Identify with Christ. So when things happen, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You know, it's just thankfulness. It's just the attitude of being thankful and not being prideful and not being self-centered and looking at this from God's point of view. That doesn't mean I'm not self-centered. It doesn't mean I don't think of myself all the time. It means that as I'm doing that and I identify sin and I identify areas that are wrong, I go into correction mode. I, I, I first I pray, I confess. Then I remember what the word of God said and what, you know, and then I start to work back through the word of God and readjust myself because I what? I don't want to be separated from Christ. I don't want to be separated from the blessings. I don't want to be separated so that I can't produce fruit. I can't do it. I don't, I, I can't do it on my own. I'm a total failure all the time. So let's go on. It says that do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. Listen to this statement. The world and its desires pass away. But whoever does the will of God lives forever. Let me say it again. The world and everything about the world and all the desires and all the accomplishment passes away. It's gone. But listen to this. But whoever does the will of God lives forever. And what's the will of God? To trust in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, so that in 10,000 years we will all be together. And Jim Nicole was in here all the time. We talked about where are you going to be in 10,000 years? Well, in 10,000 years, he's going to be with the Lord and we're going to be there with him. If we trust Christ and we follow him in that. So it's not, it's not like you're earning your salvation. You have your salvation. Now you are doing what? You're obeying Jesus so that Jesus can work through you. Because if you don't obey Jesus, you barely get into heaven like you went through a, like a fire and you smell like smoke, Paul says. Everything about your life is burned up. Nothing of value comes through. By the grace of God, you go through because of Christ and, and you've trusted him. But you just ruined the whole thing by because you would not stay connected with Christ. You would not abide in Christ. And so he had to take you out. He had to go ahead and say, okay, you know, and he, and he, he, he disciplined you. He did everything he could. And you just fight because that's the type of guy you are. That does not bring honor and glory to the Lord. That is not what he, Jesus wants from those who say they're followers of Christ. And you say, well, Don, you know, I don't know, you know, is this true? Yeah, look at Peter. Peter said this, he said that, and Jesus said this. And what did Jesus have to pray for Peter? Peter, I pray for you because the evil one's going to come and sift you. There. You know, I'm going to pray that you get through your, your time. Everybody has these times. So Jesus prayed for us. I'm praying for you. You're praying for me to get through this time of what? When Peter did what? He denied Christ three times publicly. Did Jesus say you're not connected to me because you denied me? No. He didn't say that at all. Because Jesus, it was Jesus who chose him. It was Jesus who brought him through. It was Jesus who made through he got through his temptation. It was Jesus who said, do you love me? Oh, yeah, yeah, I love you. Do you love me, Peter? No, I do, like, do you love me, Peter? And Peter said, Lord, I, 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 you know you know me. You know, you know what's in my heart. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not capable. I'm just, and he says, you go out. And you love my sheep. You do what I want you to do. That's what he's saying. He wants us to abide. And are we capable? No. Is he capable? Yes. His Holy Spirit is capable. But you can thwart. You don't want to thwart the Spirit, right? You don't want to fight the Spirit, or do you? Uh, don't say yes or no right off the bat. Maybe, you know, up here I'd rather not. But over here I do all the time. That's what it means between the flesh and the Spirit. The flesh and the Spirit. You're going back and forth. And he, that's why Paul says in, in uh, Romans chapter 7 about the constant battle, the constant battle between the flesh and the spirit, and the flesh and the spirit. 
There, by the way, if you're not a Christian, there is no battle. Unless you are a Christian, there's no battle. There's no abiding in Christ. You, don't, you can't abide in Christ if you're not a Christian. You have to be connected to the vine first. And that comes by faith in Christ and Christ alone and what he did, not what you do. When you are, now it's all about what you're doing. Not to earn, You're not earning your salvation, but now you're responding to the love and the mercy and grace that God's given you. And now it's about you and the things you do and say and think and everything. And there's a difference between how much glory and honor do you bring to the Father and, and how much glory and honor, you, you know, where are you? And that's why you come to a men's group. That's why you come to a men's group. That's why you listen on the Zoom. That's why you're part of the group. That's because this is where you get what? Encouraged, motivated, prodded, and pushed, and pulled. So you, you sit in a table with a bunch of men. You can't fake it. That's why some guys don't come to the group. And they say, do I have to sit next? Do I have to talk to somebody? And, you know, they're all upset that they have to get in a group and they have to talk to somebody or something. Because if that happens... What will happen is if they're, they're cheating on their wife or they're doing something over here that's sinful, that they're drinking too much or they're doing that, it'll come out. And they don't want it to come out because they want to hide. And the Holy Spirit says, we don't want you hiding. We want you to come out. We want you to be part of a group. And we want to love you and encourage you and brothers in Christ to come together so that you can then abide in Christ and God can work through you and just and the and the, uh, with the, you know, the fruit of the Spirit will come out and, and do wonderful, wonderful things. So let, let's just read this. So it says, the world in its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Now, number seven, Jesus Christ is not to be ignored. Let me say this. <laughs> Let me say it. Jesus Christ is not to be ignored or taken for granted by those who say they are Christians. Now, let me say this. I'm talking about those who say they're Christians. You should not be ignoring Jesus Christ. You should not be ignoring what he said. You should not be ignoring what he taught. You should not be ignoring his commands. If you say you're a Christian, you do not ignore Jesus. If you will not identify, listen, with Christ in all areas of your daily life, God will deal with you. As his chosen child. In other words, he's not going to allow you, the father, to go out and make a fool of yourself if you're, if you're a Christian. And it, it talks about it in Hebrews 12. And he's going to, all the things that happen in your life, he's going to discipline you. He's going to bring you back, okay, because you're a child, all right? So listen to this. This is in Galatians 6, 7, and 8. I want you to get this, and please listen. This is critical. Do not be deceived. He's talking to Christians now. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. God cannot be mocked. And those who mock God are the ones who say they're Christians and then they're out there Ignoring Jesus and not identifying with Jesus. And that's why Jesus made it really clear. You don't identify with me. I'm not identifying with you. This is as close to anything I can think about that would say that these people, this is really worth, you know, these people don't really know Christ. They don't have saving faith. They say they're Christians, but they're not. This is coming to that moment where you know that Jesus said he separates the goats from the sheep. And he says, I never knew you. Because there's no me in you. I'm not there. Because, see, when it counted, they may did all kinds of Christian stuff. But when it counted, and it was right there, they didn't identify with Christ. You know why? They didn't think it was in their best interest. Let me say it again. They didn't think it was in their best interest. When you think it's in your best interest to identify with Christ, you do. And when you don't, you don't. And what God's saying is, if you belong to me and you're hooked, you always identify with me, no matter what's going to happen to you. Okay? No matter what. So it goes down. Let's go to the next one. It says, um, number eight, it says, living by the desires of the flesh ignores the leading of the Holy Spirit. This is in Romans 8, 5 through 8. This is a critical statement. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. 
The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. Think about that for a minute. This is the most amazing statement. This is the, the most. This is where it all comes together. Now, look, and look at number nine. The father will discipline his children who make a habit of playing the fool. What's a fool say in the heart? There is no God, right? And a, and a man who goes out and says he's a Christian, but he lives as though God's not there. That's the man living like a fool. He's living foolishly. It says this, number nine. It says, Psalm 119, 67, and then 71 says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I obey the word. Verse 17, uh, 71 says, It was good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn your decrees. In other words, God brings the word of God in order to help us and protect us. And we go through trials and tribulations to bring us back to the word of God. If you're a Christian, you come back to the word of God. And then you know that, and that's what saves you and brings you out. Number 10, it says, this is why Paul reminds us as professing Christians, as professing Christians, that we are to obey, obey, in quotes, obey. Let me read this. This is in um, Philippians 2.13. It says, therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. It's his good purpose. And we are to be in the, like in the fear of the Lord in the sense of always knowing that he is the one. He is the one, and we're to follow him and stay connected and remember and learn the word of God. So the last statement I have here, if you want to be connected to Jesus Christ, the one and only true vine of God, you can. You can. Because the Holy Spirit, as you turn, the Spirit will bring you. It says, you will seek me and find me. In Jeremiah 29, 13, it says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. When you want to be connected with Christ, do you want to follow Christ? Because, see, you can't do it. Only God can do it through his spirit. But the desire to do it is the key. What do you want? What do you want in your heart? What do you seek? Are you seeking to be God's man? Are you seeking to be used by God? Or are you seeking just to get in by the skin of your teeth into heaven and you have to get all the stuff you want in this world too? You have to choose. That's why uh, the gift of generosity is such an amazing gift. That, you know, you can talk and tell people what to do and all that. But believe me, I deal with people that like that. And if you think about the people who go out and they actually physically go to other places and they and they go into slums, they go into places and they and they take care of people, they love people in, in their distress. And you deal with people when it's awkward and it's smelly. One of the things I noticed when I went and traveled was the smells. John had to pull me out of one time of 10. I almost got sick. It smelled so bad. I went into these poor people's house and everything. I couldn't believe they lived like that. I went, you get to Africa. I went to Africa and I went through the streets and I went through, the smells were so horrendous. I could hardly believe it. Hardly believe it. When you look at uh, videos about poor areas and you look at videos in the orphanage and all, do you know what it is to have 600 kids all crammed into all these three high bunk beds and all the stuff over there and trying to keep them clean. And you got, you know, young women and young men and you try to get the bathrooms to clean and everything. Do you know the smells? And then, the, and then the sewer system goes down, and I'm begging everybody to send me funds to fix the sewer because they had a flood. I mean, you know what all this is about? This, all of the things that you and I are dealing with in this world, we have to bring them down to remember, are we going to be Christ-like in how we deal with everybody, including our wives and our children? Or are we going to be self-centered? All about me. I, I, I It's all... Yeah, it's all I can think about half time. All about me, all about me. And then, then the Lord puts it on, hey, Don, you know, it's not all about you. And you know why he does it and how he does it? Only when, I'm, when I get in the morning and I have my time of prayer and when I pray and I read the word of God and I listen to him, what happens? God's Holy Spirit convicts me and I can then confess and then he can then work in my life. Because when it's all about me, I totally am blind, just blind. 
But when I open up, then he comes in and he invades my life. And so this is what this is all about. So this is our, our message. This is what God's given us. And we need to think about that. Blessed is the man. Let's walk in the counsel of the wicked. Or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the word of God. Is that where you are? Is that what you do? Is that what your life? That's what this men's group's about. That's why we're here. So let's pray. Lord, I pray. Thank you for this time together. Thank you for the opportunity to be with the men. Thank you for your word. We love you, Lord. We're so thankful that you died on the cross for our sins and you rose from the dead. You defeated the power of sin and death in lives and made us born again, children of the living God. Our names written in the book of life for eternity. We love you, Lord, and we want to abide with you each day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it.